Hey, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. My name is Brad Cartwright and the following video is a free preview from bradcartwright.com, a website designed for Ivy economic students all around the world so that you know you will have all of the information you need to feel empowered for a unit test, a semester exam, or ultimately the IB exam at the end of your two year journey. So take a look at the website when you get a chance and in the meantime, enjoy this free preview. All right, now we're getting to a part where we're going to start using some language all throughout your studies of IB economics. And this is the evolution of classical economics into something called neoclassical economics. And this starts in the late 1800s or the late 19th century, like more like specifically somewhere around like 1870, if you want to have a nice little break in your mind. Okay, so let's take a look at the major influencers of the birth of the neoclassical economics. They were a man named William Jevons, a man named Leon Walrus, a man named Carl Menger, and a man named Alfred Marshall. And I say a man because I just, I can't help myself whenever I teach something just to think about the perspectives of what's going on here, right? Of course, during the 1700s and the 1800s, schooling was much more available to men than women. But you have to understand that like, there's a, there's a biasness that comes into when you only have one half of our world <laughs> analyzing anything, and in this case, it's economics, okay? But nonetheless, these are the guys that we got, and let's take a look at some of the things that they said that, were, that continued, and remember what we're doing here, we're talking about the evolution of economic thought, okay? So, neoclassical economics, check this out, broke from classical economics because they shifted focus from supply to demand, from supply to demand, from the supply side to the demand side of the economy. Stay with me here. Therefore, rather than the value of a good being derived from the cost, which is the classical model, the value of a good is derived from the utility, happiness, utility, happiness of consumers or the demanders of a product. That, my friends, is a massive shift, okay? So they broke. So when we go through our studies, when we get into macroeconomics, we talk about neoclassical model, neoclassical model, neoclassical model, and then we talk about the Keynesian model and all these things, but guess it. But this is where it's born. And the neoclassicists said that like, the value of something's not in how much it costs. So the value is not in how much it costs for me to make this. If this costs me $5 to make, that's my cost. But the real value is like, and what someone's willing to pay. Like, who cares if this, this, the value of this is $5, but guess what? If I'm only willing to pay four, then what's the value of this? Four. <laughs> and this happens all the time. When you see like fads, like, I, like fidget spinners, you know, it was like the most ridiculous fad of my lifetime. And, and, and like, like, they were going for like eight or nine dollars a pop. But why did they have that value? Because that's what it cost to make them? No, that's what people were willing to pay for it. And what people are willing to pay for something creates the value of the product. And if you know anything about fidget spinners, and if you don't, it doesn't matter because they're super stupid. What they were, were a great example of where everybody wanted them, they really demanded them, and the value of them went way up. And then all of a sudden everybody had one, and the demand for them went way down. And guess what, what, what happened to the value of a fidget spinner? They collapsed, it collapsed. So the value of something in the neoclassical model has to do with what someone's willing to pay for it, okay? Which kind of makes sense because that's actually the way in which it's kind of easier, easier for us as consumers to think, okay? So as a result of that, they also added something which is the advent of measuring utility. So if you're gonna say that it's my, my happiness, then how are you going to measure that, okay? So this is an example of the law of diminishing marginal utility. And the best way I can explain the law of margining utility is that there's a certain amount of utility that you get when you buy your first ice cream cone. You get it and you're really happy. It's like, ah, oh, this is great, okay. And then have you ever gone back and gotten a second ice cream cone? Like your amount of happiness from, getting this, from going from one ice cream cone to the second ice cream cone is definitely less than your happiness from the first ice cream cone. So if you think about it, if utility is your happiness, by the way, marginal just means like, 
how much utility or happiness you got from one unit to another. So marginal utility is from zero to one. That's the marginal utility, the happiness from that particular purchase. And then the marginal utility would also apply from going from one ice cream cone to two, and from two to three, and from three to four, and on and words. Well, if you think about you know, your excitement as a little kid for that first ice cream cone, you're like, wow, you don't have to be a little kid to love ice cream, I love ice cream. The first ice cream cone you get is so good and you're so happy and you're willing to pay for it. But then the second one, you might get it because you think you're gonna want it, but by the time you're done with the second one, would you get a third? Ooh, maybe if you're, maybe, but the third one's gonna make, you're not gonna make you, you're gonna be less and less happy. And the fourth and onward, because you're gonna get an upset stomach and blah, blah, blah. So the, the, the law of margin utility means that as one person, as, as a person buys one more unit of output, their happiness of having that additional unit of output goes down. One more ice cream, your happiness for the third ice cream is much less than for the second, which is much less than for the first, okay? And these dudes brought in, or the neoclassical model brought in this idea of the law of diminishing marginal utility, which is something we're gonna talk about a lot. Okay, what else came into economics during the late 1800s, early 19, or late 19th century? Mathematics, man, mathematics began to emerge as really important. And much of this work was done by Jovens, by Walrus, and by Menger, okay? So it's the evolution of economics going from a philosophical thing, Adam Smith, right? The early David Ricardo is very philosophical. And now they're like talking about measuring utility and taking utility and quantifying it. <laughs> and now, wait for it, wait for it. They're gonna actually take that idea and put it on a graph. And that's what Alfred Marshall did. So take a look at this. Alfred Marshall in 1890, look at the date, wrote The Principles of Economics. It's a book, okay? And this was the advent of the supply and the demand diagram that we were gonna use throughout all of our studies. It's the basic representation, the beginning of models to explain human behavior. And here it is, very simply, right? You have, a, mar you have a, a vertical axis, you have a horizontal axis, right? You have demand, which diminishes with, so this is gonna be price, this is gonna be output, or the quantity of the thing that you produce. And if, if this is price, right? Suppliers, if the price went up, suppliers would be willing to pay more. And if you think about as demanders, if, as the price drops, they're gonna be willing and able to pay for more. And where they meet is right there. And so we don't have to worry about the whole diagram. Let's just take a look at it right now. We'll get into it as we get in further into our studies of microeconomics. But Alfred Marshall took this behavior of happiness and made it into a graph. And this is a massive moment in economics because this is why economics is hard because economics asks us to talk about the abstract human behavior thing and then starting with the neoclassicists, start like diagramming that or graphing it in a very concrete sequential way. And that's hard. You know, human behavior on a chart, that's ridiculous, right? Because maybe, you know, if the ice cream cone gets cheaper, you would buy it, but I don't really like that many different flavors of ice cream. So it doesn't matter if it's free, I'm not gonna buy it. So it's not always true. And that's where all of these assumptions that you're gonna see that economics is based on assumptions of how humans would would in the most, in, in general behave, okay? Which is why it's both philosophy, abstract human behavior, and also quantifiable, which is mathematics and they're sort of like the scientific look at human behavior, okay? So here's the closing thoughts on the neoclassical economic like evolution of things, okay? So this is the beginning of model building. My friends, we're gonna be building an enormous amount of models. You've already seen the circular flow model, the diet, you know, supply and demand is a model. There's a bunch of modeling. Modeling, modeling, modeling becomes a basis of economics, okay? And this is based on the assumptions about something called rational economic behavior, which is that basically watered down to the idea that if something gets cheaper, I'm more willing and able to buy it. And if something gets more expensive, I'm more willing and able to produce it. If I can make a lot of money on something, I'm more willing to produce it. If I can get something for really cheap that I really want, I'm more likely to buy more of it. That's why you buy more things when they're on sale, right? And that's why they produce more things when they're really expensive. Okay. So consumers and producers are seen as optimizers. Consumers produce their, uh, consumers produce 
I mean, consumers optimize rather their utility. Producers optimize what? Their profit, okay? And this is the emergence of the self-interest as like all of us taking care of our self-interest is a key to understanding economics. It's the beginning of rational choice theory, which is something that's really big underpinning of economics. And this therefore was a huge change in the evolution of economics. This is, check this out, the movement towards a science with a reliance on mathematics and away from a pure philosophical discipline, my friends. And now you're getting it. You're seeing this evolution of economic thought, right? From Adam Smith, the classicist, David Ricardo, and now we're into the neoclassical model, which is adding this component of mathematics, adding this, this component of like objectively being able to look and study human behavior on a graph. And this is where it starts getting super cool and we're rolling on to the next one.